Смираш се паратист ли накрета? Ай, като нам си. Ние сме. 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 Марио, ако си живе сега. О, това ще не говори за политика. Добре. 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 Finland and uh, today he is our speaker and will speak about the AGS. Floor is yours, Yanis. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for, for the introduction and for, for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, it's my second time in, uh, in Poland, so it's uh, my first time in Warsaw, so I'm very excited uh, to be here and tell you about some uh, very new results we're having on something that's really entirely new. To astronomy, which is uh, X ray polarity. Uh, uh, focus on really loud AGN. Uh, what we mean when, by uh, AGN, right with the new gate, is when you have a supermassive black hole in the center of a distant galaxy. There's a lot of gas around that black hole, and uh, it sort of forms an accretion disk on its way to be consumed. Now, about 10% of the cases. Uh, we see very powerful, often highly relativistic jets uh, shoot out from, from that black hole, which you see here. If that jet is oriented on the plane of the sky, then we call that a radio galaxy. That's for historical reasons. If the jet is pointed directly towards the line of sight, we call that a uh, blazer. So I'll be mostly telling you about radio galaxies and, and blazers and our efforts to understand them. So this is what sort of a typical radio galaxy would look like. This is a, a fairly famous source called Cygnus A. And you see the bright spot there in the middle, that is the AGN. The thin lines that are coming out from left and right, those are the jets. And at the end, you have these jet bubbles, we call the radio lobes. And this is where the jet uh, terminates, starts mixing with the intergalactic medium and forming shocks. Now, if you focus on the, uh, the AGN, this is what it will look like. So the bright spot we see here, we show that the core of the jet, that in radio galaxies means that it's the base of the jet that's very close to the black hole. And of course, what's coming in this direction, this is the main jet. Similar, but much dimmer feature on the other side, that'll be called the counter core. And of course, that's the counter jet. And somewhere in between this the core and counter core is the supermassive black hole that is powering both of these jets. Now imagine you're an observer at the far side of the universe and you're looking at Sigma A from that direction. So you're looking down the barrel of the gun. That's how we typically observe blazers, and most likely this is how Sigma A would look like. Now, as you can see, we've lost now all this. Very nice, beautiful structure. We just get a bright spot. Uh, we still call it the core, or it's often referred to as the blazer core. Uh, that's not the same thing. It's uh, a structure that is a few uh, parsecs away from the black hole, which I'll tell you a bit more about. And we get some of the jet because these are not oriented exactly at zero degrees to a line of sight. They are a few degrees off. So we get um, something from, from the jet as well. And there are, of course, the intermediate cases. And there is one that you might be more familiar with, uh, of course, because uh, it gave us the very first image of the black hole, which is called M87. And this is the image you see there. And you can see how M87 looks like in different wavelengths, starting from uh, the radio here on the left to optical and x rays in the middle and x rays and gamma rays on the right. Of course, the way a source would look like in different wavelengths is related to the capability, the resolving capability of the different uh, instruments. Usually for blazers, we just observe them like point sources, no matter the instrument. But whatever applies to M87 should in principle apply 
to radio galaxies and blazers as well, if it's only a matter of the orientation of the jet to the line of sight. So through a lot of work from different people, we have some sort of a basic understanding of what is going uh, on in the sources, which is summarized in this cartoon. So you have, of course, the uh, supermassive black hole in the accretion disk, you launch the jet, the jet is not very fast in the beginning, but accelerates as it moves outwards. It goes through clouds of gas. We go the uh, broad line region, and this is where we think spectral lines are coming from, at least the ones we see in the optical. And then the jet will continue to accelerate until it reaches uh, terminal velocity in what I, I told you about, we call the blazer core. The nature of that structure is still debated. Uh, but what we know of is that there is a particle acceleration and high energy emission happening there. And after that, the jet can continue at either constant velocity or it will decelerate. So you're now at parsecs and kiloparsecs away from the black hole, and the emission is mostly dominated by, by radio. Uh, now, if you look at the cartoon and you compare it to, to M87, uh, there seems to be sort of fairly, fairly similar. And in fact, uh, if you study the shape of the jet in M87, and people have done that extensively, what you will see is as you move away from the black hole, which is here, the jet seems to have a parabolic shape, and that favors uh, acceleration. So it matches fairly what we expect to happen when you're near, near the black hole, but then uh, when you go far enough out where that blazer core is, which happens to also be around the boundary radius. Uh, the boundary radius is the, uh, basically marks the sphere of gravitational influence of the black hole, after which the jet will change shape and it will become conical and that no longer favors acceleration. So it again matches our expectations on, on when you're far away from the black hole. And this is not only on M87. In fact, there was a recent study on nearby radio galaxies where they basically see the same behavior. This is just one example. They found many um, cases where they see this transition from this parabolic to conical uh, geometry. So we think this is sort of a common feature um, in the structure of, of this uh, jets from supermassive black holes. So we understand quite a bit now of, you know, in terms of structure and how, how the whole system is, uh, you know, uh, around, but what we really don't understand is where radiation is coming from. So if you look at uh, the spectral energy distribution of uh, blazars, this is what it looks like. They all basically have the same shape with just two very broad emission uh, components that cover from radio all the way to TV gamma rays. Now uh, the first uh, component is signature radiation from relativistic electrons that move through the magnetic field of, uh, of the jet. Uh, we use the peak of that synchrotron component to classify blazars into low, intermediate, and high synchrotron peak sources, depending whether our peak is in the infrared, optical, or x rays. That will come in handy uh, in just a minute. What we don't understand is how particles are accelerated to such high energies to make you know, all that synchrotron bump all the way up to x rays. And we have two scenarios for that. One is that we're looking at shocks. Uh, this could be traveling shocks, so things moving down the jet. And in fact, when we look in radio through uh, VLBI, we see radio blobs moving along, along the, ridge, the jet ridge uh, line. Uh, or this could be standing shocks. And one of the, the theories for what that blazer core is, is that this is the first the recollimation shock of as the, the jet gets overpressurized. The alternative is uh, what we call magnetic reconnection. And this is where you have now opposite polarity magnetic field lines that will come together, uh, break apart and reconnect. And you get, you can accelerate particles along those uh, reconnection lines. The high energy uh, uh, component that goes from X-rays to uh, the TV is something that we understand even less. And we don't really know what is the origin. Uh, again, we have two, uh, two competing models. One is what we call a tonic emission. This is now you have electrons in your jet. 
and electrons will make high energy radiation through inverse Compton scattering. So they propagate in the jet, they see some target photon field that could be from some external structure like the accretion disk or, or something else. Uh, if uh, they have scattered out to higher energies, we call that uh, external. Point. If uh, the photons come from the jet itself, so the electrons make the photons and then scatter them to higher energies, we call that signature of the The alternative is what we call hadronic processes. And this is now where you have protons in your jet. And protons will make synchrotron or will interact with other protons. Other protons make pions, then pions decay to secondary particles and gametes. So understanding so what's the origin of, of this high energy emission also tells us a little bit something about uh, what the jets are made of. And this has been a fairly, uh, let's say, hot topic recently since 2017, where Ice Cube, which is a neutrino observatory in the South Pole, detected the neutrino from the direction of, of a blazer. Now, that association has been uh, challenged, and there is still not clear uh, whether, you know, indeed, blazers are making neutrino and how would they do that. But you can imagine that if you're you know, able to establish that um, neutrino blazers are neutrino sources, then you open up the way to maybe understanding uh, with their high energy cosmic rays, and that will have you know very uh, interesting implications for fundamental physics in general. So this has been a very sort of uh, important part of uh, this. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that too. So whatever happens in this uh, in these jets is really driven by their magnetic fields. And that's why polarization is very important because we can trace those magnetic fields through the polarized light. So I'll tell you a little bit about how we, we try to do that with optical and, and x-rays. And I'll start, of course, with, uh, with the lower energies. So I've been a member of uh, a group called Robopol, who's been now systematically studying lasers for a few years now. Uh, we do that with a novel polarimeter, uh, which you see the design here. This is what we call a one-shot polarimeter. So we get all the information we need uh, with a single exposure, uh, which is very different from what other people are doing. It makes it a very efficient and very accurate instrument for, for monitoring. Uh, this is the 1.3 meter telescope that we're using at the Skinnikas Observatory in Crete, and that tiny little thing there, that, that's robust. So it's actually a very compact instrument as well that we can move around. Uh, this is, of course, the Skinnikas Observatory, and the lights you see down there, that is the city of Heraklion, which also happens to be my hometown. Uh, so uh, over a few years, we've studied quite a few lasers, but of course, we've not limited ourselves uh, to that. We've done quite a few other things. Uh, which, of course, I cannot go into uh, due to time, but you're more than welcome to ask me uh, about them if there's something that, that catches you. So uh, our primary objective in, in Robo was to study uh, the connection between the polarization properties and, and high energy emissions, specifically gamma rays. And we also wanted to look at a very interesting phenomenon that's rather unique to blazers. And this is what we call the rotation of the polarization angle. So for, you know, normally blazers will vary stochastically uh, until they suddenly don't. So you will have the polarization angle, which you see in the middle panel here, just fluctuate about randomly and then sometime uh, it will go into a smooth monotonic change towards one direction. And one that's done, it goes about fluctuating again randomly. This is what you see in the red points here. So before Robo, we only knew a handful of of events, and it was uh, really hard to tell anything about them, especially because we didn't even know that if those are real or not. So you can imagine something happening in the jet that will drive changes in the magnetic field, and then we see that change as the rotation of the polarization angle. But you can also imagine a scenario where on that random fluctuation, you know, the polarization angle goes into a random block process that just you know, a few steps go towards the same direction and you get this apparent rotation, but it's not anything real happening. So our first task was to actually increase the number of rotations so we can do some statistics with them. And we were quite successful with that. Just a few years of observations, we more than tripled 
uh, the number of those uh, known rotations. So then, of course, we wanted, as I said, to study what was their connection with, with gamma rays. But one of our very early and I would say very easy results was we found that the sources that make gamma rays tend to be more polarized than the sources that don't make gamma rays. This is the black uh, cumulative distribution you see here. There is no real reason why that should happen unless there is some underlying connection between the polarized properties. Uh, and high energy uh, emission. But more interesting than that, I would say that every time we would detect one of these rotations, there was always a gamma ray flare coming. So, and this is what you see here. So the y axis shows you sort of the normalized flux of the gamma ray flares, and the x axis shows you the time difference of the middle point of the optical rotation. To the peak of the nearest gamma ray flares, gamma ray flare. And as you can see, they are very well centered about zero. That cannot happen by chance. Uh, we try, you know, you throw in rotations of gamma ray uh, random times and gamma ray light curves, and you do this again, and you will not come up with the same, same result, at least, you know, with, with some, some probability, I think. Probably instead of the minus four, to the minus five, the last time we did this. So there is some underlying mechanism that's driving both the CVPA rotations and, and the flare and, and gamma rays. Of course, you know, individual events could still be random, but as a population, those have to be connected. Now, exactly what's causing them is still something we're trying to figure out, uh, but I think we're getting, getting closer uh, and closer every, every time. Another very interesting and not that intuitive result was the fact that the sources whose synchrotron peaks in the infrared tends to be more tend to be more polarized than the sources that peak in the X-rays, which is what you see here. So the way we try to explain this is by having an, what we call an energy stratified jet. So you have an electron population that you accelerate. And then you advect down the jet. The accelerator could be either a shock or magnetic reconnection. It doesn't really uh, matter. What matters is that electrons cool very fast. So the moment you accelerate them and send them down the jet, high energy emission, what makes your from the peak into the right side of your spectrum, that will come very close to the accelerator. It's a more compact region, more ordered magnetic field, it should be highly polarized. Then the electrons will propagate down the jet. They will cool down, so making uh, lower and lower energy radiation. And then that comes from a much larger volume of the jet, sees more tangled magnetic fields, that should be less polarized. So because we're looking at the fixed wavelength, so we're just R band in the optical, for the uh, low peak sources, R band is in, on the right side of the spectrum, so it's polarized. For the high heat sources, our band is on the left side of the spectrum. They should be less polarized. That was our, our interpretation at the time. So we made a, a prediction back then that first this HSP sources, high similar peak sources, should be more polarized in X-rays than they are in the optical. And the second prediction was that they should show rotations of the polarization angle, because predominantly we see these rotation in the low peak sources. Now, back in 2016, when we did this, was a very safe prediction to make because there was no X-ray polarimeter. There was nothing that can you know, challenge us. Anything we said would have been fine. Fortunately, things change. And since uh, December of 2021, NASA finally launched the first X-ray polarimeter, which is called the Imaging X-ray Polarimetry Explorer. This is a small mission, so we have a two-year lifetime and it's operating in 228 uh, kb band. So I don't know how familiar you are with, with X-rays, but that's considered sort of a low energy X-ray regime. So I decided to go up against my own best interests, and I led the study to help us select targets for these two uh, years of observation, which is what you see in this figure here. So the y-axis shows you the predicted X-ray polarization degree. That, of course, comes from simulations because we didn't have of course, we didn't have any observations at the time. 
Uh, the x-axis is the x-ray flux, which is observed by SWIFT and other satellites. And uh, the color coding matches for the uh, peak classification of, of different lasers. And the red dashed lines show you the IXP sensitivity for different exposure colors. Uh, I can already tell you that this has proven to be a fairly accurate uh, diagram, both in terms of the IXP sensitivity, but in terms of our predictions for the polarization response. Of course, IXP is not limited to, uh, to radio galaxies and blazars. We have seven what we call topical working groups. We are looking at basically anything that is uh, bright in X-rays and we think that it might be polarized so that we have what our model colors tell us. Of course, again, we're telling you more about the uh, group seven, which is blazar and radio galaxies, but you are welcome to ask me about other things as well. So uh, as you can see, we have quite a bit of sources already done in our first year uh, about. And since launch, I've been coordinating the uh, multi-wavelength follow-up program, which, as you will see in a minute, is really important to help us uh, both understand our measurements, but also put them into some, some context that we can do uh, science. Uh, the very first source we observed was actually not well, the blade that was a radio galaxy, the only radio galaxy we've done so far called Centaurus A, and this is the, the XP image of that. So Centaurus A is the radio galaxy, so you have the core, which is the base of the jet, so this is really close to the black hole. Uh, we get a little bit of the jet sort of sticking out, but it's, it's quite faint. And because XP has a large field of view, we also get this ULX source uh, on um, for free. Of course, I'm showing you the radio galaxy because for Blazer, we'll just see, you know, you see the PSF, you don't really see anything, anything else. Uh, so even with IXP, all Blazers again look like points. So I will uh, tell you things that have been published, but I will also mention uh, things that have not been published and things that are under embargo at the moment. So uh, for the remainder of the talk, please know pictures of social media so that we'll get trouble with the journals. Mm -hmm. So the two uh, key science questions we wanted to address in this uh, two years of, of observations was, of course, what is the origin of that high energy component, which, as I've told you, has implication for, for particle physics as well. Because for, as an extension, we can learn something about what these jets are. The second uh, key science question has to do with particle acceleration and maybe differentiating uh, finally between shocks and magnetic reconnection. So for the first uh, question, we need to look at this uh, sources where the peak is in the infrared. Uh, that is because optical is of the synchrotron component and X-rays are part of this, this high energy component, which we try to understand where it's coming from. And these are the sources I'm showing you here in, in black. That now I have assumed here that this is electrons we're looking at in inverse complex scattering. If you assume you have protons and some hadronic process, you get the blue points. So as you can see, those are much more polarized and we can use that to uh, tell between these two processes. But just to give you a rough idea, something you know to keep in mind, if optical uh, is more polarized than the X-rays, then we expect that to be to be looking at the electrons and the corresponding scattering. If X-rays are more polarized than the optical, then we expect uh, that to be looking at protons and some hydraulic process. Just some something to keep uh, to have a mental view. So the very first source we observed in this category is a famous one for those working on, on AGN called BLAC. Um, you see here the results from the optical campaign. So we have brightness, polarization degree, and polarization angle. Uh, we have two observations with uh, IXP, one in May and one in June of last year. And you see them in this gray shaded area. So basically that's the duration where IXP was staring at, at the source. Uh, we couldn't get a detection, uh, but we got a pretty good upper limit of anywhere between 6 and 14%, depending on the assumptions you make during your, your analysis. Uh, now, if you assume the optimistic upper limit of 6%, then we see the optical was more polarized than 
the X-rays during the HD observation. Uh, even if you assume the uh, pessimistic upper limit of 14%, you still see the optical may be more polarized, especially for the second. Now, of course, there are details that I'm sparing you uh, here that prevent us to sort of close the deal, but it starts to look like we are, in fact, looking at electrons instead of, of protons, and, and the dominant process to be some form of inverse complex scattering. Of course, you want to have some more qualitative tests of, uh, of your emission processes, and this is something we try to do with Lawrence Pearson, who is a graduate student at Stanford looking at this. Uh, turbulent multi-zone models that he's been, been working on. So we chose three sources, which you see here. Uh, the four, the first four panels show you two sources, both in flaring and quiescent states. Those uh, were candidate XP targets. And the bottom panel shows you the, um, the blazer that's been associated with a neutrino. That is unfortunately too faint for XP, but it's, it's an interesting source uh, in itself. So we did uh, sort of the full polarized and SED modeling of the sources, trying to understand how X-rays would behave um, across the state. So we specifically chose those sources because they, it's at least most of the time, the X-rays are a blend between the high uh, and the low and the high energy component in blade graphs. And the idea was to take the XP band, which I have here in the spread lines, and place it in a way that your lower half is dominated by electrons and synchrotron from the first tick. And that should be polarized and we should be able to detect it. The upper end of the XP band then will be dominated by whatever is making up this high energy component. If, these are, if those are protons, then that should also be polarized and we should get a detection. If that is uh, inverse complex scattering, it should not be polarized and we should not see it. So depending whether you get detection or non-detection of different halves, you might be a, a better test of this, of this emission process. So on a normal day, BLAC looks like this source up here. So all the X-rays that IXP measures is part of the high energy component. But when BLAC is flaring, the signature peak moves to higher energies. So the extreme end of the signature component sort of moves slightly into the X-ray band and it turns in one of, one of these sources. So we were lucky enough that in November of last year, so just six months ago, BLAC went into an outburst and we were able to trigger our observations. What you see here is the uh, X-ray campaign we have with New Star and XMM. And you see sort of the curvature you start to get in the spectrum. This is exactly because of that signature component moving in. And you know, you're not longer looking at the simple part. So what you see on the uh, right side here, the first three panels show you again the optical campaign, so brightness, polarization, degree, polarization angle. And the bottom panel will show you exactly the same thing, but in X-rays. Of course, we don't have the, the signal to noise to do the same fine job in the x-rays as we do in, in optical. Uh, so we had to restrict ourselves to three pins, but that, that proven to be uh, actually enough. And in fact, it's only this first pin that is interesting because this is where singletron dominates the high, the low energy half of the XP gap. So if you restrict your analysis to two to four kV, then you get this red point here and that is a significant detection of 20% uh, polarization. So we're really looking at that extreme end of that signature uh, spectrum. If you take the full uh, energy range, you get this blue point, and that is not a longer a significant detection. And that is telling us that whatever is making up the high energy component is most likely unpolarized, or at least is far less polarized than, than the signature. Of course, there are again some, some details here that prevent us from you know, really sealing the deal, but I think evidence now is piling up that we're most likely looking at electrons and uh, inverse component scattering for at least the low energy path. And that will cause a lot of problems to uh, people uh, trying to model, uh, to get neutrino emission 
out of this, uh, out of lasers. The second question we, we wanted to address, as I mentioned, was particle, particle acceleration. And for that, we need now the high energy, uh, the high signature peak sources. And this is because we want sources where optical and x-rays are part of the same emission process. So we can understand what is going on. And those are the sources you see here in green. So before the mission was launched, we told uh, the spacecraft people that 100 kilosecond gets you Macarian 501, which uh, is again another famous source for people uh, working in. And just a little over a year ago, uh, today and 100 kilosecond later, light speed detects X ray polarization uh, from a supermassive black hole for the very first time. And this is what, what you see here. So they show you the Stokes U versus uh, Stokes Q. Uh, the Stokes parameters are how we actually measure uh, polarization. And what this, this diagram shows you here is about a 10% polarization with a polarization angle that is roughly aligned with the jet axis on the plane of the sky, which is marked here with this magenta uh, shady data. Of course, being that the very first uh, detection, we wanted to make sure. And we got another observation just two weeks later, and we basically got the same results. Another about 10% polarization, again, roughly aligned with the jet axis. Uh, you might think those are different angles, but in fact, they're within uh, three sigma. So there's, these are not the difference was statistically significant. Of course, 10% doesn't really tell you much. Uh, you need again, to put it in context, and this is a very multi-wavelength campaign comes uh, again handy. So what I'm showing you here is the ratio of the X-ray to the optical polarization degree, or the logarithm of the ratio. And I've plotted the expectations we have from different models. From the simplest case, which is what everybody uses when they try to model blazers, which is what they call the single zone model. And that uh, basically predicts no change between optical and X-ray polarization to the much more complicated uh, model, uh, which called the energy stratified, that's also been supported by the uh, optical observations. And that predicts this gray shaded area, which means basically X-ray should be much higher, uh, much more polarized than the optical. And in fact, we see two and a half times more um, X-ray polarization than the optical. That's for the first observation, and for the second, uh, just confirm our results. Uh, in this case, we also have radial polarization. What we found uh, is that there is a near exponential rise in the polarization degree. You basically, uh, as you go from like, radio to optical to x-rays, there is uh, basically a doubling of the polarization degree in every step. But what is, I think, even more interesting is the fact that we see uh, the polarization angles to be sort of roughly consistent between different wavelengths and to be roughly sort of aligned with, with the jet axis on the plane of the sky for both observations. So we can write down what we expect from, from different models in terms of you know, the multi-wave polarization, variability, angle, and then compare that, of course, to observations. And there is, in fact, a model that satisfies all of them. And that is this, this energy stratifying uh, jet but one where electrons are being accelerated by shocks and not magnetic information. So even with our very first observations, we managed to answer all our, uh, satisfy all our objectives for at least one of our key science uh, goals. Now, of course, you will argue that this is only one source with, uh, and you would be right, but since March of last year, we have observed both Mark Aaron Fiber One and other sources multiple times, and we're basically getting the same results. And this is the second source that we observed, which is called Macarian 41, which is a little bit more dramatic. Now, uh, the extra polarization is five times the optical. The angles still seem to be sort of roughly aligned with each other, but there seems to be a little bit of axis this time. That's not a lot, that's 3.1 sigma, 3.2. Uh, so it could be that there is you know, some bend or some kink in the jet going inwards. It could be that we're not measuring the uh, angle of the jet on the plane in the sky very well. 
These sources are not very bright in radio, so they don't really make good PLBI targets. That's really nothing to worry about. Uh, what is, uh, I think, is much more interesting is this dashed line that we see here, which is a very simple analytic calculation of how turbulence would decrease the polarization degree as you move away from, from the shock. And as you can see, it matches the observations uh, very well. Of course, not perfect, but for a very simple, almost back of the envelope calculation, uh, I think it's really as good as it gets. So we are fairly confident by now that we're really looking at this shock, uh, shock emission from an energy structure. But we have made a second prediction with the probable back in the day that these sources should be showing rotations of the polarization angle, x rays. So that observation happened in May. And then we had two more in June, uh, almost back to back, that uh, had a day gap in between. So we got the uh, quick look analysis. That's basically, you know, as soon as the data gets downloaded, uh, you know, you sum up everything and the instrument team gives you some very, very nice results. And they, uh, the result they give us is that the source is polarized. And you can imagine it was the very first months of the mission. And, uh, you know, that raised a lot of red flags. There was a lot of alarm bells ringing. People were getting a little bit, you know, uncomfortable. Uh, but fortunately, very soon we realized that what the quick look analysis is doing is assuming that nothing changed. It's a light bucket, right? You get all your photons, you assume nothing changed during your observation, and you spew out the result. But if things are changing, specifically if the polarization angle is changing during your observation, you end up summing up different polarization states and you will cancel your polarization. And in fact, we were looking at the very first X-ray polarization angle rotation, which is uh, what you see done in this, this panel. So this red and blue points, this is the X-rays showing this. this uh, change the polarization angle and at the same time, if you look at the crosses and, uh, and diamonds here, that is the optical and radio results which show that nothing is really happening. And this is actually something we would have expected because uh, in this, this scenario, the X-ray, optical and radio emission regions are not co-spatial exactly. You need time for electrons to cool down as they propagate in the jet. So optical and x-ray is not coming from exactly the same uh, region. Now, so that means that if we kept observing in the optical for you know maybe a couple more weeks, we might have seen that rotation manifest itself in, in the optical regime. We didn't know at the time, unfortunately, and we missed, we missed our chance, but now we do. So uh, hopefully uh, next time we'll be much more prepared for, uh, for this and, and catch them at the same, the same time. Uh, very recently, so just two months ago in February, we saw the opposite uh, result. So this is from another source called PG-53. And again, here I'm showing you the, the results of the optical campaign. This time we see a rotation in optical. And this is what you see with the red points on uh, on the bottom panel here. So we have again two observations. Those are now spaced by a week. The second was unfortunately cut short because we had a, a T wall. Um, but basically, uh, the optical was rotating probably even before uh, our, our XP observations, and it stopped somewhere sometime just after. Uh, if you look at the blue and, and this uh, yellow points, those are radio observations. That doesn't seem to do anything. Uh, and we're still working on the x-rays, but our preliminary analysis shows that basically uh, x-rays were not doing anything as well. And this, again, is, is really something I would have expected if in this picture of this energy stratified uh, jet. So if we had observed with, with high speed just you know, here so a couple of weeks earlier, we might have found another of this x-ray rotations. Hopefully, uh, we'll get more, more in the future. So just to uh, summarize, I hope I, I convinced you how polarization can be a very uh, useful tool to understand the high energy emission processes. 
Uh, and I cannot stress enough how, how excited I am, but I think a lot of people in the community about finally having X-ray uh, polarization available to us. We're really solving decades old questions with just the very first uh, observations, not just in Blazor, but all the other uh, sources we've been, we've been observing. And this is really just the beginning. Uh, we have still about another year to go. Uh, and if we're successful, and we've been very, very successful so far, it's not unlikely that NASA will grant us a guest investigator program, which not only means that the mission will continue, uh, but it will also become a community instrument. So everybody can apply for time and, and do your science. It's been very exciting. Uh, but in terms of these, uh, what we're learning so far for, for Blazars is that uh, the synchrotron emission at least in the steady state, it looks like it's coming from shocks. And uh, in this energy stratified uh, picture, we're still working on, on the high energy component. And hopefully, we'll have answers very more definitive than the answers very soon. But so far, everything is pointing towards electron and uh, interstellar. Thank you very much. Uh, any question? Yes, not up, please. Thank you. Thank you. So I just want to, I, I, I'm not sure if I understood correctly, but when you were talking about uh, this, the thing that uh, about x ray polarization angle that it's changed during the observation. During the observation. Yeah. So, yes. So it changed so while you were so during the exposure time, so it was changing. Within seconds, or what do you mean by change? I mean, yeah, so you have to take into account uh, that in X rays, you know, we count the point. It's yeah. not like in the optical, you know, five minutes you get uh, an exposure done. This was like six days of observations. Uh, so, so you can split it into beams basically, and then measuring polarization in different beams during that time. And then you see that different beams, this is basically what you see. So in different beings, the polarization seems to, to change uh, over time. So it was changing in the days, right? Or Those are, I think, uh, 10 or 20 kilosecond bins. Uh, so that is sort of our resolution, let's say. So some hours. Yeah. yeah. Okay. In optical, it's changing over days. Okay. We've seen faster. <laughs> Yeah, uh, more question? I have a question. How do you calibrate the, the X ray polarimetry? Do you use any standards in, in zero pole standards or high pole standards? So most of the uh, most of the calibration was done on the ground. So there are uh, you know polarized beams and non-polarized beams that they've done. Uh, sort of extensive testing. We were sort of lucky. This was the mission was supposed to be launched in 2020, but because of the pandemic, we took two more years of, of calibrating the instrument with different, uh, you know, setups. But the most of the calibration is, is happening on the ground. What we we're mostly on board. Uh, they're using um, a bright X-ray sources to do alignment of the mirrors, mostly. But No. More question. Uh, any question from internet? So uh, I don't see any more questions. So let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. Thank you.